want to begin our lesson today by quoting from one of the great prophets of old, from long ago, days of yore. This prophet is not Isaiah or Jeremiah, not Elijah or Elisha. In fact, this prophet's not that old, as old, but yet his words still echo down the corridors of time, demanding to be heard. In fact, this prophet you may never have even heard of. Obviously not as popular as Isaiah, Hosea, Joel, Amos. This is the prophet Milo. You ever heard of the prophet Milo? I want to read to you from his words. Milo never claimed to be a prophet. He was actually just considered himself a devout Anglican priest. But he uttered some words that have really echoed down the centuries. I want you to listen to what he said. He said, zeal to promote the common good, whether it be by devising anything ourselves or revising that which hath been labored by others, deserveth certainly much respect and esteem, but yet findeth but cold entertainment in the world. The word entertainment means it's used in the context of, no, it's coldly received. It's not warmly welcomed. It is welcome with suspicion instead of love and with emulation instead of thanks. Emulation is a word which means contention or strife. So here, Prophet Milo is saying that whenever somebody historically has tried to do something new, and of course he's building up towards specifically talking about some something they're doing. And he says, you know, when you set out to do this, you got good intentions and it's always misrepresented. Instead of people appreciating what you're doing, you're doing it with the sincerest motives. There's going to be people that, that instead of receiving you with love, it's suspicion. Instead of receiving you with gratitude for what you're doing, instead it's emulation or contention. And he said, and if there be any hole left for cavil, that is, cavil is an old English word which means to find fault with, with for no reason. Pay attention to that. If there be any hole left for cavil, and cavil, if it do not find a hole, will make one. In other words, there will always be people out there who will invent reasons to further their cause if they have a problem with something. And so he says it is sure to be misconstrued and in danger to be condemned. What could Prophet Milo be talking about? Have you heard of Prophet Milo Smith? Milo is a form of the name for Miles Smith. You ever heard of him? He was specifically talking, in fact, in that preface to the work that they were doing, he goes on to say that he's talking about whenever you try to do something new or even revise something, it's automatically going to be met with skepticism. He gave some examples like the Roman calendar when it was updated. And, and then he goes on and he, and he basically says that the greatest opposition, the most severe vilification historically has been reserved for those who try to modify or change the, the current translation of the Bible, which was what they were in the throes of doing. And... It is interesting that anybody that tries to come up with a new version, can you imagine that today? Somebody coming out with a new version and people would be upset about it? Of course not. Why is that? If there be any hole left for cavil to enter and cavil, if it do not find a hole, will make one. It is sure to be misconstrued and in danger to be condemned. Why would somebody make up reasons for condemning something? I guess, as Prophet Milo says, it's kind of the nature of things. You know, when the King James Bible was in its beginning and formation, it was not the intention of the king to, to have a Bible that he would authorize. It came in directly. In fact, the millennial petition, or the millenary petition, was a document that was signed supposedly by a thousand Puritans that felt that the Anglican church, now remember, the Anglican church is in its infancy, not just not even a hundred years old, 
and the Reformation is now going on, and there's a lot of people in the Anglican Church that feel like the Church of England is too Catholic still. And they sent the millenary petition, which was their demands, that they wanted these changes. And the king wanted to make peace, was one of his utmost desires, was to make peace we had between the Protestants and, and the, all this stuff going on. So that set the stage as a response to the millenary petition, something called the Hampton Court Conference. Hampton Court was the name of a palace, still around today. You can visit it. And that is where the, the King James Version was conceived. So there's this big debate about all these lists, the things that the millenary petition wanted addressed by the, the leaders in the Church of England. And as they were doing that, somebody stepped forward as a concession. Uh, Richard Bancroft, I believe it was, just threw out this idea that, uh, as they were talking about, because of the Geneva Bible, the Geneva Bible was the issue. The Bishop's Bible was not. It was a Bible that came, and that was the official Bible of the Church of England, and it was hastily done uh, in response to the Geneva Bible, in reaction to uh, one, one Puritan said he would rather read the Koran than read the Bishop's Bible. And it was just known, you know, it was a unanimous that, that it was not a good version. And yet even by that time, King James was hesitant to say that the Bishop's Bible had errors because that was the official Bible. He did not like the Geneva Bible, primarily not because it was a bad translation. It was an excellent translation. In fact, all the translators, I mean, most of the clergy were using the Geneva Bible instead of the Bishop's Bible. But King James despised it for one reason, the notes. Because the notes that were in the Geneva Bible were very primarily the big gripe that he had was it was it was anti right of kings the divine right of kings and I won't go into all that just for time's sake but he really resented those notes and so from this Hampton Court conference while the discussion is going on and they're wrestling with these issues having nothing to do with translating a bible Somebody suggests, well, you know, why don't we just come up with a new Bible, kind of a way to appease one of the members that were there. And all of a sudden, this thought that just popped in someone's mind, uh, there, there came the desire now we were going to come up with a new Bible, and it was going to be authorized by James Stewart the first, King James the first, And... And so, you know, he gave his instructions. In fact, in one of his instructions to the translators, uh, here's what they did. Robert Barker, he was the, the publisher of the King James, the original first King James Bible, came off his press. He actually printed 40 copies of the Bishop's Bible because, again, that was, that was the official Bible of the Church of England. And... King James gave, they were scattered. Those 40 copies were given to the different groups. The, uh, you know, the Cambridge, Westminster, Oxford, two groups in each that were going to be translating different parts. And they spread those Bibles out. And his instructions were, number one was the ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the original will permit, the original languages so King James was hesitant to even disparage the Bishop's Bible. And that was actually when the King James Version was com composed. It wasn't, you know, that they sat there and wrote the new text. It was actually, as Miles Smith said, it was like to revise the revising of that which had been labored by others. That's exactly what the King James Version was. They just all wrote their notes in the margin of the Bishop's Bible and only one copy of the Bishop's Bible from the translators has remained. And it's, it's there to be examined. It's pretty neat. The goal was use the Bishop's Bible, make as little alteration as possible, ended up being a lot. And that was the initial, that was what was set out. But it, immediately there was resentment. We have the Geneva Bible. 
the reformers, the Puritans were like, they, they were happy with that. Why do we need a new Bible? And so if you read the preface, throughout the whole thing, there's this defensive tone that he's bolstering, he's preparing the minds because this isn't going over real well. And it never has. Anyone historically that has tried to change the Bible of that time, whether it's a, a good translation or not, has met with incredible resistance. In fact, any Bible that was translated that's been in use, popular use, has over the years, because it is a translation of the Bible, has taken on an aura because it's the Word of God an aura of perfection. I'll give you an example. Augustine, in, he was born in 354 AD, died in 430 AD. He thought that the Septuagint was perfect. Now the Septuagint, if you look up the Septuagint, it is described, here's how it's defined, by multitudes of sources. It is a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament made for Greek-speaking Jews in Egypt in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC and adopted by the early Christian churches. The word Septuagint comes from the word 70 because it is claimed that there were 70 translators, a group of 70 translators, and that's why the Septuagint is often called LXX. L is 50, Roman numeral 50, X is 10, twice, so LXX refers to the Septuagint, which is the Greek copy translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And by that time, by the third, you know, fourth century, Jerome was getting ready now. Greek had now kind of fallen by the wayside, wasn't used. Latin was now the main language. And so a man in the fourth century, a man named Jerome set out, he was a contemporary of Augustine, Jerome set out to make a translation of the scriptures in the common tongue. In fact, that's what the Septuagint was. It was the Old Testament in the common tongue. And Augustine was having fits. And there's even communication between the two. And it's so interesting to read some of their letters and some of the arguments that Augustine made in condemning Jerome because why do we need a new translation? We have the Septuagint, and it's the Word of God. It's been used for centuries, for hundreds and hundreds of years. God has used the Septuagint to save countless numbers of souls. On top of that, the Bible that Jesus quoted from and Paul quoted from, that's the theory. So Jerome went ahead and wrote, the Latin Vulgate. Well, that met very skeptically initially, and before you know it, it was accepted. And now, hundreds of years later, Erasmus, the 16th century, early 1500s, Erasmus now was setting out to make a Greek translation of the scriptures, and he was opposed severely because the Catholic Church accepted the Vulgate, which was the Latin translation that Jerome had done. And now the Catholic Church was having fits. Why would you want to change the Vulgate? Because it's the perfect inspired word of God. The same argument that Augustine used when Jerome was translating the Vulgate, the Bible into Latin. It, it is a vicious cycle, folks, that any time someone tries to to write something new, especially the Bible, they are going to be met with incredible resistance. And Prophet Milo, Milo Smith, knew it. And he even articulated it so clearly in the preface to translators. So now we have a translation that has now been around for hundreds of years. Huh, I wonder. Augustine thought the Septuagint was perfect. Jerome didn't believe that. Jerome wrote a translation not believing that the, his translation was perfect or that the Septuagint was perfect, just that it needed to be improved. Well, give enough time, what happens? 
Well, now the Catholic Church thinks that Jerome's Vulgate is perfect and are slamming Erasmus because he wants to come up with a new version. Isn't that interesting? What about today? King James Bible's now been around for hundreds of years. I wonder if the same thing, the same take, the same arguments are being used to somehow claim that the King James Version is perfect? Well, listen to this. I have several books. I've told you I've read many, many books. One of the books that I read early on is the King James, King James Version Defended by Edward Hills. And I'm going to read to you from Edward Hills. Now, this was written in 19, this was published, rather, in 1956. So what did the Bible-believing church believe about the King James Version in 1956? Remember, it came out in 1611. And what about this version? Well, listen to what Edward Hill says. Do we worship the King James Version? Do we regard it as inspired, just as the ancient Jewish philosopher Philo, 42 AD, and many early Christians regarded the Septuagint as inspired? Hmm. Edward Hills, Edward Hills is acknowledging that Philo and, and other early Christians regarded the Septuagint as inspired. Or do we claim the same supremacy for the King James Version that Roman Catholics claim for the Latin Vulgate? Do we magnify its authority above that of the Hebrew and Greek Old and New Testament scriptures? We have often been accused of such excessive veneration for the King James Version, but these accusations are false. Now, let me make a caveat. They were false in 1956. Because what I'm about to say, many people take issue with it. And now from 1956 to now, you know, less than you know, 50 years, things have changed. Here's what he says. In regard to Bible versions, we follow the example of Christ's apostles. We adopt the same attitude toward the King James Version that they maintain toward the Septuagint. In their Old Testament quotations, the apostles never made any distinction between the Septuagint and the Hebrew Scriptures. Why? Evidently because of their great respect for the Septuagint and the position which it occupied in the providence of God. In other words, the apostles recognized the Septuagint as the providentially approved translation of the Old Testament into Greek. And then he talks about this, and he makes a statement which... Nobody would have argued with in 1956. I want you to listen to this. This is in a, in a book called The King James Version Defended. Admittedly, this version, talking about the KJV, admittedly, this version is not absolutely perfect. It is trustworthy. If you have that book, you may want to get it out. Turn to page 229 to page 230, 229 to 230. Uh, my copy still has that, and I believe this book's still being published. I wonder if they've kept that in, because something's changed. People's attitudes, folks, there's people that take issue with that. In the same way Augustine took issue with Jerome, in the same way that the Catholic Church took issue with Erasmus, who was one of them, himself a Catholic, Here's another book, Which Bible? And there's a quote in this book. If you have it, you may want to get it out. It's on page 33. And it's not, uh, actually the, the writer of Which Bible is David Otis Fuller. David Otis Fuller was influenced in a big way by someone that has radicalized the take on the King James Version. Now, I have come to understand that this man, who I'll be quoting from in a little bit, has since been written off, but his false teaching is still firmly entrenched. So in which Bible, which is a defense of the King James Version, he says, no reasonable person imagines that the translators were infallible or that their work was perfect. Did you hear that? This statement by uh, Edward Hills, 
his quote, the quote from Terrence Brown in which Bible? Nothing radical about that. It certainly is in harmony with what we're reading about in the preface. This one he said, no reasonable person imagines that the translators were infallible or that their work was perfect. Again, let me read that. No reasonable person imagines that the translators were infallible. Hear that statement? It has since been taken out of the recent versions of which Bible by David Otis Fuller. That statement has been removed, which tells you that something's changed. Something changed. What did he say? No reasonable person imagines that the translators were infallible. <laughs> Mr. Brown, if only you knew. You know, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 2 asked the believers in Thessalonica to pray uh, for Paul and his, those that are traveling with him that they may be delivered from unreasonable men. It's a good prayer today. In fact, if you have which Bible, you might want to take it out to page 33. If you have a really older one, that that quote's going to be in there. No reasonable person imagines that the translators were, were infallible. Folks, today, many people are going back to what Augustine believed about the Septuagint. In fact, because of that, because of this claim with the Septuagint, there's now a new twist on it. And the Catholic Church believed about the Vulgate. There are now people that believe that about the King James translation, that it is perfect. So what was the Bible? I want to talk to you. Because it goes back to this whole thing in Luke chapter 4 and verse 20, 21. Jesus Christ is in the synagogues and he opens up the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 9, and he reads verses 2 and 3. So he's opening up. Obviously, it is a book. It is a copy of a translation from Isaiah's time. So we're talking about he's not reading the actual original documents from Isaiah. And he reads that scroll from Isaiah 9, 2, for, two to 3. And in Luke chapter 4 and verse 21... And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So Jesus took not the original copy. He took a translation of the scriptures. And he said, This day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your eyes. Can you really take a translation that's not perfect and speak that authoritatively? You see, this whole idea that Jesus was quoting from the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, which was common knowledge. Bible scholar after Bible scholar after Bible scholar, conservative Bible-believing scholars believed that the Bible of the Apostle Paul, the, the Bible of Peter, the Bible of Apollos, when they were reading it was the Septuagint. But now there's a new take on that. You see, it is admitted by many that the Septuagint, and this is the whole argument. Remember we talked about Easter, how people go, to, they're going to such extreme lengths. In fact, remember what Miles Smith said in the beginning? He said, if the any hole left for Cavill to enter and cavil, if it do not find a hole, will make one. Do you remember that? There will be people that will make up arguments that are new arguments because they, they, they have to defend the perfection of a translation. And do you understand that if the Septuagint was really the translation that the, the early church, the first century church, read from, and quoted the Old Testament. It's not the Masoretic text that they quoted. Well, sometimes they did, but then they would, the majority of the time, it is evident that they're quoting from the Septuagint. But now, that can't be true because that's, everybody knows the Septuagint is not a perfect translation. 
And would the disciples, would Jesus quote authoritatively from a, a translation that is not absolutely perfectly inspired? People, so many people that, again, claim to love the King James Version slam when doctrinal statements, in fact, going back to the fundamentals, you know, I'm a, I'm a fundamentalist, which goes back historically to the, 20, the beginning of the 20th century when they mainline churches. All of a sudden, people were questioning the fundamental basic doctrines of Christianity. And so the Bible believers within those movements began to articulate through these articles that were written. A couple businessmen uh, funded this work, and they ended up addressing and defending the faith that was once delivered. And so they had, you know, one minister from this place write a defense of the virgin birth. Another one would write a defense of the inspiration of the Word of God. And they dealt with all these things. And thus was born fundamentalism. What used to be called in the 1800s, evangelical, anyone that was a Bible believer was called evangelical. Well, now in the 1900s, the people that were Bible believers were called fundamentalists. And so these things ended up being bound in something called the fundamentals. And in the fundamentals, there are, there's this statement articulated twice, which is very similar to statements in our, in our doctrinal statements. And it says, we, to the effect that we believe that God inspired the Word of God. And here's the phrase that people are freaking out about because of this whole thing. In the original languages. I have heard so much cavil about the claim when somebody says the original documents. In other words, Peter said, uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That way, the, the inspiration of the Word of God goes to those original manuscripts when they wrote. And now what we have are copies, and this is the whole argument that some people are speaking unreasonably. That's why I'm bringing to your attention uh, the preface of the, of the King James translator. So this one guy understood that if we believe and we accept this, that the Septuagint came centuries before Christ, and it was what was used, it was the Hebrew uh, it was the translation of the Old Testament in the Greek-speaking world that was used by the early church. Nobody denied that. Until a man who claims to be great authority on, on Bible versions came out and, and made this statement. I quote, Did Christ and the apostles quote from an imperfect Bible? He said this, because he slammed that. He denied that. His claim is that the Septuagint wasn't around in Jesus' day. They weren't quoting authoritatively and dogmatically from a, a, a translation that would not be perfect. And everybody knows that the Septuagint is not perfect. So we can't have this. So he invented this thing that Origen, it was centuries after, Origen came up. He made the, he's the one that made the Septuagint. And here's what he says. I want you to listen to this. People who believe that there was a Septuagint before the time of Christ are living in a dream world. Now, by the way, there is no... The book that I referenced here, as I'm saying this, there's no documentation. He makes assertion after assertion after assertion dogmatically, but he never cites any source. In fact, it's so evident, and I found this not just with this guy, but so many in our camp of people that, that they just love the translation of the King James Version. I mentioned earlier James chapter 3 where there's a distinction between the wisdom that's from the world and the wisdom that's from above. And as I read through, I, I only read this guy's books because a, a group of people that were in our church when we started years ago were being heavily influenced by this man. It just did not sound right. So I started reading his books, and the man talked out of both sides of his mouth. Every book this guy wrote, he went to a particular Bible college that I guess he had a falling out with. 
every book he's ever written could be subtitled, Why I Hate, and then it's the university that he went to. Every book. I mean, throughout the whole book, everything's woven. This man had an ax to grind. He, you know, he was strife and contention oozed out of his words and his pen. And all, all you had to do is go to James chapter 3, and, and you throw the guy's books out. But listen to what he said dogmatically. People who believe that there was a Septuagint before the time of Christ are living in a dream world. First of all, why did he say that? He said that because everyone knows that the Septuagint is not perfect. And it was not the text, the, the text that was used as the foundation to translate the King James Version. For that reason only, this man is dismissing what thousands of scholars and just honest people that are studying the facts have acknowledged. So what about the Septuagint? What about it? Those people who believe there's a Septuagint before the time of Christ are living in a dream world. So let me tell you some dreamers, okay? Metzger is a, a Bible scholar that uh, many of us in different colleges and universities, Bible schools, would quote Metzger. He said this, the Bible of the early Christian church, it is almost always from the Septuagint version. Uh, I could give you, I have here, and I'm not even going to do it, statement after statement after statement of authorities on manuscripts and Bible translations that will tell you that my original definition of the Septuagint is the real definition. Again, what is the Septuagint? A Greek version of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament made for Greek-speaking Jews in Egypt in the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C. and adopted by the early Christian churches. When I was in Bible school, I learned that, and I went out and bought a copy, a very expensive copy of the Septuagint. And then I, and then I read some things. I believe some of these books that cited nothing, that, but they made very dogmatic statements. And all of a sudden I thought, oh no, the, the Septuagint's bad. I threw it out. Do you know that you, you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Everything that I bring out in these is being disputed. It, it goes back to what Miles Smith said in the preface. If there be a hole left for cavil, and Cavill, if it do not find a hole, will make one. He had no idea. Well, I guess he did, because this is just history repeating itself, of what was going to happen with his translation. In fact, listen, read some of the arguments between Jerome and Augustine. You know, why Augustine was incensed. Jerome was going to do this new translation. And you're, you've got almost word for word things that the king, some King James defenders are saying about the King James text. And even this is denied. There's a book out, there's a book out that just denies Dead Sea Scrolls. There have been portions of the Septuagint found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, let me read to you from Karsten Peter Thied. He's an archaeologist and he's an expert on papyra and different fragments in the Qumran, Qumran is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And there were fragments of the Septuagint dating to the time of Christ and before. Now, if that's true, and this is the big thing, if that's true, then what people have believed, the scholars and the definition, the Septuagint, the 70 translators translated, translated the Old Testament into Greek from the Hebrew centuries before Christ, then that would be true. You see what's at stake? In fact, it's interesting that he says that from the second century onward, Jews often refused to use the Septuagint because it had become the Bible of the Christians. So listen to what Thede wrote, Karsten Thied. This version of the Septuagint came into being in northern Egypt in the third and second centuries B.C., Although only a few Greek scrolls of the Septuagint, or rather fragments of scrolls, were found at Qumran, six in cave four and 19 in cave seven, smaller finds confirm that the Greek Bible was known even at the Dead Sea during the first decades of early Christianity, 
the Jews who decided to follow Jesus and wrote what was to become the New Testament quoted almost exclusively from the Septuagint. And it is certainly noteworthy that the Greek finds, Septuagint, from K4, have been precisely dated to the period from the 1st century BC to the early 1st century AD. Now, it was the Essenes, which was a religious sect during the time of Jesus. Rome destroyed the Essene community in AD 68. Jerusalem's destruction occurred in AD 70, and Massad fell in AD 73. So if the Essenes really possessed the Septuagint in the Qumran, it is confirmed if, if they really found scrolls in there because of the destruction of the Essene community, and if they really had, and there's all kinds of Old Testament par parts, parts of Isaiah, there's so much that's found that's just confirmed the Bible and the historicity of the Bible. If the Septuagint is with it, then that means that that is the text that the New Testament church and even Jesus would quote from. Over the years as I've read my Bible, I often wished, I wish somebody would come out with like a biography of one of the translators you know, I'd love to read that. You know, for decades, any book on the King James Version, anything about it, I, I read it. I, I would buy it. But I always wondered, man, I'd love to, why don't I know anything about the translators? And then I found out that there was a fire in a, in a place called Whitehall, which is a castle that stored apparently the majority of the documents from around the time of the translation of the King James Version, all the things that were going on around that time and the writings from the, the actual translator themselves. Later, you know, in the 1600s, this fire just wiped out most of the documents. So much was lost in that fire. So I, I, I lament, I think, you know, when I read this, you know, about the Septuagint, and I wish I knew, what did the translators, what, were, what was their take? You know, you, you, uh, you learn in Bible school that there's this thing called the Septuagint that was what the disciples and the apostles quoted, and so many conservative commentators are, you know, quoting which specific Septuagint this verse is and that verse, and I mean, they've got it all spelled out, and now I'm reading that the Septuagint is just a hoax, I wish, I wish that I knew what did the translators think about the Septuagint? You know what? We can know. Do you realize that there has been, though that fire was devastating, there has been a document that has been preserved that tells us exactly what the translators thought about the Septuagint. Did they believe it was the, the Bible that Jesus quoted? Because so many people don't. And, and if, they, if it was, did they believe that the Septuagint had problems? I mean, because that's why, you know, that's this hole that we've caviled, we've figured out here. That's why we're changing this, you know, because if, the, if the, they were quoting authoritatively from a book that had errors, so... Guess what? You know this preface that I'm telling you about? Authoritative, dogmatic, very connected to the King James translators because it was published with the translation by the translators. You know, this thing called the, the translators to the readers. You know that thing? They actually address the Septuagint. But listen to this. It is in the preface, and it's under a subtitle called The Translation of the Old Testament Out of the Hebrew into Greek. Myth. Uh oh, no, wait a minute. It doesn't say myth. It just says the translation of the Old Testament out of the Hebrew into the Greek. I'm going to read it to you. Because, folks, the King James translators are telling us through all this cacophony it's not real. It's, it's not legitimate. You know, what about the Septuagint? Listen to what they say. 
But when the fullness of the time drew near that the Son of Righteousness, the Son of God, that's Jesus, should come into the world, okay? So this is pre-birth of Christ. When the fullness of the time drew near that the Son of Righteousness, the Son of God, should come into the world, whom God ordained to be a reconciliation through faith in his blood. Praise the Lord. That's our Jesus. It pleased the Lord, okay, the King James translators, their God believes that they believe their God, it pleased their God, the Lord, to stir up the spirit of a Greek prince, even Ptolemy, Philadelphus, king of Egypt. Wait a minute. Actually, that's, you know this definition of the Septuagint? That's the king, Ptolemy, Philadelphus, king of Egypt. He, he was a king that ruled before Christ came into the world. The King James translators are saying that this really happened? Wait, wait a minute. I thought, to quote... People who believe that there was a Septuagint before the time of Christ are living in a dream world. Wait a minute. The King James translators are living in, in a dream world? If they're living in a dream world, should we really trust these men to translate the Word of God into English? They really believe the Septuagint? Listen to this. It pleased the Lord to stir up the spirit of a Greek prince, even Ptolemy Philadelphus, king of Egypt, to procure the translating of the book of God out of Hebrew into Greek. This is the translation of the 70 interpreters. Ah, oh, no. He's got to be talking about the Septuagint. Commonly called 70 interpreters, Septuagint, LXX. King James translators are living in a dream world. Apparently, they go on. This is the translation of the 70 interpreters, commonly called, prepared the way for our Savior. The Septuagint prepared the way for our Savior. Would have had to be written before he came. Therefore, that language was most fit to contain scriptures, both for the, both for the first preachers you mean the early church, Peter? All those early disciples were preaching from the Septuagint? Oh. Well, nah, maybe not. That's just what the King James translators believed. All right, okay, wait a minute. If maybe the first century church was preaching from the Septuagint, and maybe Jesus, you know, when he quoted that authoritatively, this day this scripture is fulfilled... All right, maybe it was the Septuagint, but maybe the Septuagint, like the King James, is perfect. And there's, it's inspired, it's perfect, there's no error in it. Whew! Well then, certainly, if the King James translators believe that the early church and Jesus were quoting dogmatically and authoritatively from the Septuagint, then at least, they, certainly, they can't believe the Septuagint has errors. <laughs> Let's read on from what the translators say. Again, this is, this is 70 translators. Therefore, that language was most fit to contain the scriptures, both for the first preachers of the gospel to appeal to for a witness. And they go on. It is certain that... It is certain... Wait a minute. It is certain that it needed in many places correction. <laughs> Wait a minute. The first century church, the, the, the preachers of the New Testament, when they're preaching and quoting from the Old Testament, they wouldn't read from an from a imperfect Bible, would they? The King James translators believe that? Yet it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to them to take that which they found, the same being for the greatest part true and sufficient. True and sufficient? Where's the confidence in that? Shouldn't they, you know, shouldn't they be dogmatic and confident rather than uncertain? Uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Let me read that again. This is the King James translators talking about the Septuagint and what they believed about it. Now, wait a minute. 
we understand the great people that love the King James Version understand that people that believe the Septuagint are living in a dream world, right? Let's read it again. It is certain that it needed in many places correction. Yet, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to them to take that which they found, the same being for the greatest part true and sufficient. Man, that sounds like Miles Smith's preface, doesn't it? Not at all what I was expecting. How about you? You who read all these great defenders of the King James Version? Something's wrong. They said this, rather than making a new translation in that new world and green age of the church to expose themselves to many exceptions and criticisms as though they made a new translation to serve their own interests. Can you imagine somebody claiming that anyone that comes up with a new version has wrong motives? I can't imagine that happening today. Again. Rather than making a new translation in that new world and green age of the church to expose themselves to many exceptions and criticisms as, as though they made a new translation to serve their own interests, this may be supposed to be the reason why the translation of the 70 was allowed to be in common use. Folks, when you read what the King James translator said about the Septuagint and what people that claim to love the King James Version are saying about the Septuagint, We've got a major contradiction going on. Number one, the translators believe that the Septuagint, the LXX, existed before Christ. And number two, the translators believe that the Septuagint was the Apostles' Bible. And even though the Septuagint is not perfect, who's living in a dream world? I end again with the words of Prophet Milo, who said very wisely, zeal to promote the common good, whether it be by devising anything ourselves or revising that which hath been labored by others. He's talking about revising a Bible translation. Deserves certainly much respect and esteem. It didn't get it then in 1611, and it doesn't get it today. It finds cold entertainment, reception in the world. It is welcomed with suspicion, not love. It's, it's met with emulation or contention and strife instead of thanks. And again, listen to this prophetic utterance. If there be any hole left for cavil, to find fault without reason, that is, to enter and cavil, if it do not find a hole, will make one it is sure to be misconstrued and in danger to be con condemned. To make a pretext, a reason, to just make up a reason to defend why we don't need a new translation is exactly where we stood, where we stand. And it wasn't where the translator stood, but that's why we condemn anyone that uses even the New King James Version, I know all the arguments and I know all the defense about the... It, it is just amazing when you begin to see things through the perspective of the translators and then you step back and you begin to re-examine some of these things that you took for granted that ha you know all these bold or, or you know dogmatic claims that people make without they just make them up but they claim here's the thing if you're if you're dogmatic enough and you impress people with your intellect you can get them to believe anything and you can bully them into believing that the King James version contains advanced revelation the Septuagint had problems it's evident. Augustine didn't believe that. The Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, had problems. Jerome knew it wasn't perfect. The Catholic Church didn't believe it. And now there's claims made, not you know, about Erasmus. And, and you know what's interesting? I'll talk about this later. We have demonized certain men and... Be beatified or beatified, be beatified uh, other men 
And I've taken people's words for it. This guy's a good guy, this guy's a bad guy, this guy's a good guy, this... And you know what? We're condemning some of the wrong people. Some of the people we condemn were more sound than we would think. E even some more sound than the King James translator, some of them. And some of the people were turning into saints and angels actually died in good standing with the church that you and I would, would have some problems with. That's another lesson. But again, whether it's your belief about Easter or whether it's your belief about the Septuagint, you need to go back and realize, folks, that we are, we are embracing things and, and, pe and pe believing people that are they're not quoting from the perspective of the King James translators, and yet they're daring to speak on their behalf. And as I've already demonstrated, there's some real contradictions going on. Which is it? Who's making up? Again, if there be any hole left for cavil to find fault without reason, to enter, and cavil, if it do not find a hole, will make one. They're going to invent a reason. So who's inventing what? Could Augustine have been wrong that the Septuagint wasn't not, was not perfect? The King James translators thought that. Could the Catholic Church be wrong that Jerome's Latin Vulgate was not perfect? Jerome thought that. Could some of the King James Version defenders today be wrong that the King James Version is a translation and not without error? You be the judge.